Good morning, everyone. The subcommittee of the Indo-Pacific on the Foreign Affairs Committee will come to order. The purpose of this hearing is to spotlight different dimensions of the People's Republic of China's economic coercion, economic coercion tactics, and discuss how we can coordinate an allied response. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Welcome. This is our Indo-Pacific Subcommittee's hearing examining the People's Republic of China's econ economic aggression and predatory practices. Today, we will hear from experts on the PRC's economic coercion, and my goal for this hearing is to give the witnesses an opportunity to sound the alarm on the PRC's predatory practices against our partners, allies, and even everyday Americans. One of our witnesses is a first-hand victim of PRC's economic coercion and predatory practices. The PRC often successfully intimidates individuals and entities not to speak openly. So we thank you, Mr. Alon, for having the courage to tell your story publicly. I recall in October 2021, my colleague, Mr. Brett Sherman, said during the House Financial Services Subcommittee hearing on China, that several financial industry representatives had withdrawn their original commitment to testify because of fear of backlash from China. It is unacceptable for the CCP to limit Americans' free speech, and even more unacceptable that the CCP can do it without consequences. Last month, U.S. Chamber of Commerce warned that China's mounting scrutiny of American companies have dramatically raised the risks of doing business in the country. I would like to submit for the record a Reuters article titled, China Detained Staff, Rates Office Due Diligence Firm, Mintz Group, as well as a Wall Street Journal article titled, Bain Staff in Shanghai Questioned as China Targets Foreign Businesses. These headlines are unfortunately the new normal for American businesses. And as you will hear from our witnesses, we are not doing enough to make these predatory practices consequential to the CCP. The CCP must know that every act of coercion will result in a countermeasure from the United States and its allies, and that the PRC must abide by the same international rules and norms that everyone else in the international community is bound by. We must also recognize the immense economic pressure that the PRC puts on our allies, partners, and friends around the world. The CCP uses debt trap diplomacy through the Belt and Road Initiative to achieve its political goals abroad, so much so that it is willing to crash economies and generate instability as it did in Sri Lanka. This pressure is especially overt in the Indo-Pacific Islands, Pacific Islands, where PRC diplomats host politicians for dinner, and those politicians live with envelopes full of cash and promises of major infrastructure projects. It's unfair. It's an unfair fight, and we need to show up. We must equip our diplomats in these countries to respond to economic coercion, and our diplomats need a clear sense of the direction we are going. To respond to economic coercion, the United States should take several steps. As a first step, American money and technology that fuels CCP coercion and predation cannot keep going to the PRC. It makes no sense to increase the PRC's ability to coerce the United States and help it gain more leverage over us. Second, if the PRC is unwilling to change coercive elements of its economy, the United States must make it more costly for the PRC to maintain that system. That means action on tech transfers and subsidies. Third, the United States needs to build a coalition of countries, in particular in the Indo-Pacific, that adopt the same actions. And I cannot stress enough the importance of coordinating our responses to economic coercion with our allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific. When even a few countries act in concert, we can undermine core CCP strategies and objectives. We must stand together to make sure each CCP coercive act against an aligned country fails. So I look forward to hearing from our panel on how to put these objectives into practice. 
The chair now recognizes the ranking member, the gentleman from California, Mr. Berra, for his opening statements. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you for holding this hearing. This is a topic that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. We've um, introduced legislation on and is incredibly important. Um, let me start by saying, you know, the, um, the PRC will, you know, try to put out a dialogue saying, you know, that the United States is trying to, you know, isolate the, 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 the Chinese economically. The truth is, um, we'd like to maintain the status quo, which has lifted all the countries in, in that region through a rules-based order. But we have to respond to Chinese aggression and Chinese economic coercion. And the countries in um, the Indo-Pacific know firsthand. You can look at um, Chinese economic coercion against the Republic of Korea when um, we deployed THAAD batteries for the protection and the defense of Korea. You know, the Japanese have faced economic coercion and blowback. The Australians have faced economic coercion and blowback. You see Chinese aggression in the South China Sea. You see them encroaching on Vietnam's um, exclusive economic zone, the Filipinos' exclusive economic zone. And it's incredibly important for us to understand um, how they're using um, economic coercion and how we can counter this. You know, in, even more so worrisome is what they're doing uh, in recent um, weeks and months. You know, we've seen direct targeting of American companies in terms of um, targeting of Micron. Um, now we're seeing them go after consulting companies like Bain Capital and, and others. And I'd argue this is not in China's um, interest because as they start to target specific companies, it'll make it much harder for us to continue to think about how we do business in China, how investments flows into China. But again, Xi Jinping has kind of signaled where he's headed. Um, in the last Congress, we were able to, to introduce a bill and pass a bill, the Countering China Economic Coercion Act. This bill um, authorized the, the administration to establish an interagency task force to respond to the PRC government's acts of economic coercion and required the evaluation of the impacts on U.S. business and economic performance. This Congress, in a bipartisan um, support for robust response to the PRC economic coercion, we've introduced H.R. 1135, the Countering Economic Coercion Act of 2023, led by myself, Ranking Member Meeks, Chairwoman Kim, and Chairman of the House Rules Committee, Tom Cole. There's also a Senate equivalent. This bill would give the President new tools to provide rapid economic support to partners and allies facing economic coercion from the PRC and hold the PRC accountable for its actions. Um, this is the type of legislation that we should be doing to make sure we can um, both support our allies but also um, react fairly quickly. It's also my hope that as the G7 um, meets in, in Hiroshima, um, that they will also discuss economic coercion, and hopefully we will see um, you know, some statements of support for rules-based order and how the G7 can work together to support one another, but also to support some of those smaller economies and smaller countries should they face Chinese economic coercion. So again, um, Madam Chairwoman, I appreciate um, your holding this hearing. I think this is an incredibly important topic and this is a bipartisan, bicameral topic. So with that, let me yield back, and again, thank you. Thank you, Ranking Member. And other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record, and we're pleased to have a distinguished panel of witnesses before us today on this very important topic. Mr. Alan Raphael is the president and CEO of Formal Femtometrics. Thank you. Dr. Derek Scissors is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Mr. Matthew Reynolds is a fellow in the economics program at the Center for Strategic and International uh, Studies. And Mr. David Fife is an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for a New American Security and was previously the US Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. Thank you all for being here today. Your full statements will be made part of the record, and I will ask each of you to keep your spoken remarks to five minutes in order to allow time for members' questions. I now recognize Mr. Uh, Aland for your opening statement. You got five minutes. 
Uh, Chairwoman Kim, Ranking Member Barron, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. It's an honor to be here and share my story. Today I will testify about my company's recent experience with trade secrets and intellectual property theft and how that theft highlights industry-wide vulnerabilities in developing advanced semiconductor production in the United States. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Femtometrics Incorporated, a small California-based company innovating inline process control tools for advanced semiconductor production. We produce a complex tool system that is both wholly unique and utterly vital to progress in advanced microchip manufacturing. Our tool system, the Harmonic F-Series, uses unique non-destructive techniques to detect advanced microchip manufacturing blind spots created by the introduction of new materials, new processes, and new 3D architectures. Femtometrics was founded in 2011, building on decades of Department of Defense-funded research at various institutions, including Boeing, NASA JPL, and the Institute for Space Defense Electronics. Femtometrics technology is essential to any country wanting to lead in cutting-edge integrated circuit manufacturing capability. It provides vital data to advanced chip makers, increasing yields and decreasing the field failure rate of chips sold. Also, it is the only metrology tool in existence that functions in line for critical applications within newly emerging chip structures and designs like Gate All Around, also known as Intel RibbonFET and Samsung MBC Fed. In September 2020, Femtometrics' Vice President of System and Field, a Chinese national, resigned. Shortly after, another Chinese national, hired at the first's recommendation, also left the company, followed by a third. During their duties, the three Chinese nationals were trusted team members privy to the inner workings of Femtometrics' technology. The three had significant experience building, calibrating, and using the Harmonic F-Series systems, though they worked in different areas. One even invested in the company while employed there. As we later learned, the three individuals were able to piece together the trade secrets they were separately privy to and create a competing copycat business in China called Wei Chong Semiconductor. They made a business plan presentation that contained highly sensitive and proprietary information which they used to solicit Femtometrics as customers, all while still employed there. In the business plan, they did not even remove Femtometrics' name from product images. Femtometrics also discovered that they covertly absconded with thousands of files and years worth of proprietary information upon leaving the company and snuck those files to Wei Chong in China. In addition, because one was also an investor in the company, he had access to and seems to have taken additional materials. Wei Chong has also filed Chinese patents using Femtometrics' technology to publicize trade secrets and thwart legal challenges to enforce American trade secret laws. In 2022, Femtometrics sued the three Chinese nationals in federal court. Wei Chong has retained a multinational law firm to defend the lawsuit. Counsel for Wei Chong has stated their intention to wage a legal war of attrition. Nonetheless, Femtometrics is committed to fighting and defending what is right because the United States cannot afford to lose Femtometrics as that would critically undermine U.S. semiconductor capabilities and leadership. Assuming Femtometrics obtains a judgment as a practical matter, it will not be enforceable in China. A permanent injunction would likely limit Wei Chong's prospects for expansion beyond China, but not within. The American legal system is not designed to address deliberate international thefts of this kind and is not adequate for the task. Foreign companies like Wei Chong have become accustomed to exploiting the court system's slow pace and high cost. Alternative means of addressing such international theft are needed. Wei Chong is not an outlier, but an exemplar for the theft of American intellectual property. It begins in China, when someone like a venture capitalist knows someone else, like a technologist. The technologist works to create rapport with the target company. Once the technologist has the required access and data, the venture capitalist fund funds a Chinese company supported by the stolen technology. The venture capitalist funds litigation through the copycat company and attacks American intellectual property and discloses trade secrets through published papers and patent applications. Then, predatory venture funds, likely owned or controlled by foreign entities, approach the undermined American company to invest despite the foreign challenges. They seek proprietary information on technology, customer status, and market position under the guise of due diligence. Their primary goal is to utilize leverage created by the first venture capitalist to eviscerate the American target company further. Developing a novel inline process control technology costs between 20 and 100 million dollars or more and takes approximately 8 to 10 years of development. During that extended pre-revenue period, new companies are vulnerable without significant support from large organizations. Small companies like Femtometrics are innovating against all odds domestically but cannot protect these innovations from foreign agents. Due to the theft of Femtometrics technology, Wei Chong is now a company making a vital tool for advanced semiconductor production. While novel hardware is fundamental to technological advances, inline process control tools rely on algorithms to function and prove. When a tool is integrated into the production line of a microchip fab, its efficacy grows. This is because the algorithms learn from access to a more extensive data set. 
This means that if the Weichong tool is installed at leading edge microchip makers fabs instead of the femtometrics tool, the femtometrics tool will swiftly become obsolete. Moreover, the tool would be a Trojan horse, allowing Wei Chong to use the improved and improving algorithms in other areas, further accelerating foreign technological advancement. Lastly, a Chinese firm would be the sole supplier of this strategic global resource. There would be no competitive American source of this vital tool. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. <clears throat> I now recognize Dr. Scissors for your five-minute opening statement. Thank you. Uh, the chair stole my thunder some, um, but I will go into more detail. Uh, that is to say, if you want to respond to Chinese predation, the minimum step is to stop helping China become a better predator. We have been doing that continuously um, at times when China was less of a predator than it is now. There is no longer any excuse. American money and technology should not be uh, allowed to help uh, the PRC become better at coercing uh, our, and our allies and us and harming our interests. Let me give you an example. Um, in the case that uh, my colleague on the panel is talking about, can American money still flow freely to these, this, this uh, Chinese firm while it's in U.S. court? Is there any warning provided to investors that you might be supporting a company that has uh, uh, been accused with, with merit of, of taking U.S. IP? Nope. Nope, no restrictions. We can pour money into that company. And in fact, on the Chinese side, if you are successful in stealing IP, you become subsidized and more attractive to American investors. So let me uh, flesh out the, the point, the main point. Um, let's start with the fact that we choose not to respond to Chinese coercion. We have the capability to do so. Um, the uh, measures showing this, I'll just, I'll just be brief. Um, we have a little less debt than China, a little less of a debt burden, hard to believe because our debt burden is very high, but there's even worse. We're a little bit younger, both trends of those are in our favor. Um, the wealth gap as measured by Credit Suisse is widening between the US and China. It's not a question of China's catching up quickly, catching up slowly, the wealth gap is widening. The annual GDP gap is about the same as it was 10 years ago. So the idea that we can't stand up to the Chinese, that they're the rising power, we're the declining power on the economic side doesn't make sense. Our allies, of course, are much richer and more prosperous than China's allies. They don't call them allies, but close enough. Um, and that would widen the gap if we were able to work together with our allies. Let me say one more point about this. There's a lot of talk about the dollar losing its status uh, to, the, to the yuan. Um, there's, there's no sign of that whatsoever. Uh, for, for that to occur, the Chinese would have to be willing to allow money to flow freely out of China. And they're afraid to do that. They're afraid to do that because they've mismanaged their economy. So until you see stories about money flowing freely out of China, worry about our support for the dollar, our policies, but don't worry about the yuan challenging us. With regard to China's industrial policy, uh, the goals, I think, have shifted under Xi Jinping. That's a matter of, of, of debate. I don't think they've been trying to maximize growth at least for the last five years. Um, what they're doing instead is, is, looks more like gaining economic leverage, taking an in indispensable position in key supply chains so that they can threaten you and it's harder to threaten China. The tools haven't changed that much. We've heard about one, which is uh, coercive IP transfer. Um, another one is skewing competition in their favor uh, through regulation and subsidies. Large swaths of the Chinese economy are guaranteed monopolies. Uh, State-owned enterprises have a national monopoly or a regional monopoly. There's a lot of revenue involved that makes them a, 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 a difficult competitor on the revenue side. There are also subsidies for expansion globally, um, far in excess of, of, of what we've considered in the United States. On the tech side, the original problem was requiring, requiring tech transfer to operate in China. Now they've become, as we've just heard, more predatory. You don't have to go to China anymore to have China steal your IP. They'll come to you and steal it. Um, U.S. responses in the, in the last minute and a half, we've done very little. Uh, the tariffs that were imposed during the Trump administration had little effect on trade. And during that, and I use this expression very sarcastically, during the trade war, U.S. investment, so 2017 to 2020, U.S. investment in Chinese stocks and bonds rose $780 billion. I really would like someone to declare a trade war on me and I will issue a bond and money will pour in. That is not standing up to China. Um, the Biden administration has been extremely hesitant uh, in its responses, in my view. Congress tightened export controls in 2018. The Bureau of Industry Security, first under the Trump administration, then the Biden administration, ignored part of that tightening with regard to foundational technology and then set it aside. 
Uh, we had ship export controls promulgated by the Department of Commerce in October of last year, but we have not gotten the final version, and we are still negotiating with South Korea. South Korea is currently exempt from those chip controls, which undermines their purpose. Um, on the stop helping side, uh, we need to pass binding legislation, not an executive order. Executive orders are always inferior to congressional action that reviews investment. And there's a simple principle. If we don't let the Chinese buy it here because we're protecting the technology, we should not allow American funding to develop it in China. That is not a sensible uh, action on our part, a set of policies where you can't buy the technology, but we'll help you fund it. Um, lastly, I would say uh, there are others, but punishing a few high-profile beneficiaries of IP coercion. We're not going to be able to do this comprehensively. The cat's out of the bag. But we would send a signal to the Chinese that there could be consequences if you steal American IP. Thank you, Dr. Scissors. I now recognize Mr. Renners for your five-minute opening statement. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairwoman Kim, Ranking Member Barra, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. It is an honor to be here today, and I look forward to uh, discussing this important topic with you all. I've been asked to talk today about our recent CSIS economics program report entitled Deny, Deflect, Deter, Countering China's Economic Coercion. China's economic coercion carries real costs for the firms and sectors that find themselves downrange of Beijing's bullying tactics. The threat of coercion can deter allies and partners from pushing back against Beijing's malign behavior in other domains, whether that be human rights violations in Xinjiang or the suppression of democracy movements in Hong Kong. That said, China's use of economic coercion carries costs for Beijing, too. Therefore, a well-informed counter-strategy presents an opportunity for the United States to exploit Beijing's missteps and assert leadership on the global stage while also enhancing our soft power. In our report, we looked at eight prominent cases of Chinese economic coercion that spanned approximately the past 13 years. Although each instance of Chinese economic coercion is unique, common patterns and characteristics emerge across the cases examined. We detail several of those characteristics in our report, but I'll briefly go over three of the most salient here. <coughs> First, China displays a preference for implementing its coercive measures through informal means. This provides Beijing some plausible deniability. Second, Beijing prefers to target items in which it enjoys an asymmetric advantage in the structure of trade. And third, China displays a cost and risk aversion. This complicates its ability to inflict a significant economy-wide cost on the countries it targets. Our most surprising finding, however, was just how ineffective China's economic coercion was. Across the cases, Beijing had only mixed results at achieving its short-term goals, and in fact, Beijing's bullying often carried long-term strategic costs for China as well. Take Australia's experience, for example. Despite restrictions on its wine, coal, and some agriculture products, Canberra has refused to back down in its efforts to counter Chinese interference in its domestic politics and in its calls for an investigation into the origins of COVID-19. In fact, Canberra has only been pushed into greater strategic alignment with the United States since China's bullying began signing on to the AUKUS security agreement in 2021. Australia's case also highlights another interesting finding from our report. That is that China's economic coercion intersects with U.S. interests in a more counterintuitive way than one might at first expect. China's economic coercion certainly works against U.S. interests in the obvious ways, in that it challenges the rules-based international economic order, divides allies and partners, and makes it more difficult for the United States to build coalitions to push back against China's malign behavior in other domains. However, at the same time, China's economic coercion can actually work with U.S. interests by driving trade diversification, harming China's global image, and pushing targets closer to the United States, again, as we saw in the case of Australia. That is not to say that China's economic coercion should be tolerated. A world free from China's economic coercion is preferable to one where the threat of coercion looms over the decision-making of sovereign nations. Therefore, based on these key insights from our report, we recommend a counter strategy which aims to deter China's economic coercion by building resilience and providing relief to targeted allies and partners. The United States can help countries build resilience in two primary ways. The first being through the negotiation of free trade agreements that offer signatories real market access. And the second, by preemptively helping to identify and mitigate countries' vulnerabilities to China's economic coercion. The ongoing supply chain resiliency initiatives that have emerged in the wake of COVID-19 offer logical platforms in which to embed these efforts. When China does coerce, the United States should be ready to quickly provide relief to targeted countries. The United States has several existing tools it could use to do so, such as export financing, temporary tariff relief, and sovereign loan guarantees, to name a few. We also recommend augmenting this toolkit with the creation of a new coercion relief fund. 
The counter strategy should also be embedded in a larger diplomatic messaging campaign, which draws attention to U.S. efforts to build resilience and provide relief to targets, while also shaming China for its bullying behavior. The United States should also seek to multilateralize its response by encouraging allied countries to adopt similar strategies. It is therefore encouraging to see reports this week that the G7 is discussing how to jointly counter China's coercion. In this way, the United States can mitigate the cost of coercion for allies and partners, further reduce the effectiveness of China's bullying, and over time, demonstrate to China the futility of its actions. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. I now recognize Mr. Feith for your five-minute opening statement. Thank you. Chairwoman, Chairwoman Kim, Ranking, Bar, Ma, Ranking Member Barra, and members of the subcommittee, it's a privilege to testify today. My testimony has three purposes. First is to define the problem of China's economic coercion. This is an enormous challenge for U.S. foreign policy and national security. The harm we face is broader than the bullying of individual countries in a handful of cases. Economic coercion is central to Chinese leader Xi Jinping's grand strategy. Collecting and exploiting leverage over foreign targets is how Xi approaches the outside world. It has helped him perpetrate genocide in Xinjiang with impunity. It is part of why he may feel confident enough to invade Taiwan and discount the risks of world war. In the coming years, China wants to become a kind of super OPEC, controlling key world economic supplies as leverage over all of us. These are the stakes. My second purpose is to suggest how the United States and our allies should counter China's strategy of economic coercion. Much of the debate on this matter has focused on mitigating the harm done to victims of China's policies. We should also seek to deter China by imposing costs on its coercive behavior. To do this well, however, U.S. and allied policymakers need to know more about relative strengths and weaknesses in our economic relationships with China. We can improve our knowledge by launching a 301-style investigation in Washington, akin to the effective 301 investigation into Chinese unfair trade practices undertaken in 2017-2018. The U.S. could also lead, perhaps via the G7 or AUKUS, in the creation of a standing multilateral body for studying these issues together with allies. Most of all, we should limit U.S. and allied exposure to Chinese coercion in the first place by limiting trade with China in strategic areas. It is important to ensure that the U.S. and allied balance of dependence with China, especially in key technologies, continues to favor us. My third purpose is to warn that current U.S. policies are increasing America's exposure to economic predation by China. We have important environmental interests, for example, but increasing our reliance on Chinese solar panels and Chinese components for electric vehicles is dangerous. It creates national security perils similar to those that Germany inflicted on itself by becoming dependent on Russian energy in the years before the Ukraine war. My written testimony has more details on all these matters. For now, I'll note further that this challenge is unprecedented in our history. The United States has never faced a geostrategic rival with as much economic coercive power as Beijing wields today, let alone the economic coercive power that Beijing credibly seeks to wield in the future. The Communist Party's goal is to decrease China's dependence on high-tech imports from other countries while making other countries more dependent on imports from China, especially for critical technologies. The aim is to maximize global economic leverage for future coercive use. It bears repeating. The goal is for China to become a super OPEC of the 21st century, a single country that decisively controls crucial economic inputs for the world economy. Policymakers should constrain these aspirations now, first through coordinated deterrence, second through strict limits on China's access to technology, capital, and data controlled by the United States and our allies. We should not wait until China has taken fateful steps such as attacking Taiwan that could lead to superpower conflict. We and our allies require a strategy of constrainment to counter China's economic coercion. This strategy would take note of the realities of economic interdependence and aim to adjust them to serve Western security interests. Constrainment can provide deterrence, working to deflate the confidence of Chinese leaders that they can achieve their aims through aggression and war. We do not want Chinese leaders to feel optimistic about their coercive economic leverage over us and our friends. The new U.S. and allied export controls on semiconductor technology are a step in the right direction. If enforced diligently, the rules could foil China's ambition to make itself a home for advanced chip manufacturing. They can ensure that China remains dependent on the United States and our allies for these critical supplies. While we're at it, U.S. and allied policymakers should not ignore so-called mature semiconductor production. We do not want China to dominate the global production of chips needed for lower-end electronics, such as cars and critical infrastructure systems, either. Constrainment 
should strive to maintain a favorable balance of dependence in a wide range of areas. It should, for example, strengthen the dominance of the U.S. dollar as a global reserve and trading currency, extending Washington's ability to monitor and punish money laundering, weapons proliferation, bribery, and other dangerous actions by Beijing. Constrainment should remind China of its dependence on foreign sources of food and energy, while reversing our growing reliance on Chinese batteries, solar panels, and other green technology. The green technology point is especially crucial because trend lines appear to be moving fast in the wrong direction. As Washington subsidizes solar energy, electric vehicles, and other renewable technologies, are we protecting against the risk of growing dependency on China? Failure to do so would be grave strategic neglect. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan recently gave a speech underscoring the importance of both greening U.S. energy supplies and limiting, quote, dependencies that could be exploited for economic or geopolitical leverage. Yet there appears to be little in current policy or in the language of the Inflation Reduction Act or other such bills to ensure that we are protecting ourselves properly. We should reduce risks that U.S. subsidies and green energy targets give greater coercive power to China. We should carefully review the downsides of Chinese renewables exports into the U.S. energy market. Let's draw on the wisdom of the Hippocratic Oath. China already has enormous up. Power Your time's up, and Thank we'll you. make note that your full written testimony is in the record. Um, I do also want to make a quick announcement that our votes are called at 940, so we'll go as long as we can with member questioning, but uh, we may have to take a short break to go and vote and come back. Um, I want to thank all the witnesses for joining us and you know, sharing your testimony. Uh, Mr. Allen, I want to thank you again for coming and um, for the courage to tell your story publicly. And I just want to ask you to elaborate on your experience um, so we, we can understand how we can stop what happened to you from happening to other American companies in the future. Um, you, you may I ask uh, which aspect I should elaborate on? The challenges, the, the coercion, what kind of experience you had while you were doing business with China? I, I have not done business with China, but apparently China has done business with me. <laughs> <laughs> it's stealing the information, yeah. Correct. So then can you um, talk about some of the laws or regulations that is, um, I know I was told that you were approached by China to try to sell your business to them and you did not do that. So could you um, talk about that? You know, what stopped you from selling your company to a PRC uh, venture capital? I, I can't confirm that they were a PRC venture capital, but I know they're Chinese. And what stopped me is because I'm an American and I have sell a critical technology that if I am the only source of that ends up in Beijing and I am approaching you saying ni hao, that I have a very different uh, way of looking at the world than, than that of an American. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there anything else that you can share with us about the challenges? So we can, we can have the public, especially the American companies, trying to uh, you know, do business with China or if they are facing with the similar uh, economic coercion from China. Uh, we're relying on policymakers to creatively utilize all the tools in the toolbox to help us. So what I can suggest is that you know, my stick is the courts and it's ineffective. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Scissors, you know, I recently joined uh, Congressman Ed Case to introduce legislation authorizing the president to implement a pilot program of economic defense response teams to provide emergency technical assistance to countries who are subjected to coercive economic measures. You're aware of that bill, right? Yes. So um, what is missing in our response to countries under the threat or use coercive measures? And do you think the response team's reference in that legislation can improve our response. I'm sorry to say this, but I think what's missing is credibility on our side. Um, you know, we basically, when you're being, if China is coercing another country, Australia, Lithuania, South Korea, um, Taiwan, uh, the, the number one thing the U.S. would like to have is, is to tell people, hey, we have to work through our policies, we have to implement our legislation, uh, but, but trust us, we're going to come help you. And I don't know that we always have that. We don't have that in part, as, as you and I have both mentioned already, because we're helping China at the same time we say we're going to help whatever country is being targeted. We also don't have it because um, the American uh, policy attitude toward trade has changed in roughly the last 10 years, where if you say something like, oh, you know, to help out 
a, a fairly major exporter of a product, we're going to make it easier for them to sell to the United States because the Chinese are using their market size to coerce them. You're going to get opposition to that. The people are going to say, no, 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 the, the China coercion part is not as important as the trade part. And so uh, I think any steps Congress takes, they don't have to be large. If they're credible, if they're put into law, and this is not an attack on any administration, EOs die off. If, if Congress takes steps that are, that are put into law, that's going to help. Because I think the first thing we need to do to, to, to reassure our allies is to say, you can trust us. It might take us a while, but we are on your side, and we will take steps to show that. Thank you. You know, um, one of the things that we can do is to ensure that PRC does not have the tools to use the uh, the coercion in the uh, allies, and especially in the, in the Pacific, who are developing countries that need help from us, which is why this Congress, we passed the uh, PRC is not a developing country. They are using that as a, uh, uh, in a way to game the system so they can use that special status to get the uh, low interest rates or no interest rates from the international uh, groups like the World Bank, IMF, and then they use that loan to backstop and reinvest in those developing countries that truly need help to set up the debt trap. That's one of the things that I think we're using, but I know there is a lot more that we can do. Uh, Mr. Fight, I want to ask, how do we get allies to join the, co uh, the cause to push back on China? Well, there's, there's a need for uh, the sort of support and consultation that we've talked about, uh, certainly for the sort of uh, supply chain resilience, you know, there has been a lot of certainly post-COVID greater discussion about shifting supply chains. But I think this economic coercion issue raises the illustration of how really enormous that issue is. It's fundamentally about macro trade relationships in the world and unwinding really decades of shifting of greater exposure of the US market and of our allied markets to China. If that isn't reversed, China's ability to course will continue to grow. Thank you. Let me now recognize Ranking Member Berra for your five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, yeah, sometimes we are slow to recognize the threat and so forth, but I, I think everyone's eyes are wide open um, today. You know, a decade ago, two decades ago, the hope would have been as you know, China developed a middle class, an entrepreneurial class, they would um, adopt what a lot of the rest of the world has, free market um, opportunities and so forth. Clearly, we don't have to guess the direction that Xi Jinping's PRC is headed. You know, he's certainly signaled where, where he wants to go. And again, maybe we were a little slow to recognize the, the risk, but I think the the world and the United States certainly is doing what it can to have the tools and be ready to counter that. You know, in this Congress, we've introduced the Bipartisan um, Countering Economic Coercion Act um, of 2023. And you know, some of the specific things in there um, are authorities that we'd like to give to the president to, you know, if we see um, China targeting some of our trading partners, you know, the, um, the ability to reduce elim and or eliminate um, duties, modify tariff rate quotas, um, requesting appropriations and authorization for foreign aid and financing, expediting export licensing decisions, and expediting regulatory processes. Mr. Scissor, or Dr. Scissors, I certainly agree that it is better for Congress to act and put into legislation. I'd be curious um, about your thoughts. I'm sure you're aware of that bill. Um, um, your thoughts on that bill and strengths, but what, what is it missing? Well, I, I think the strength is exactly what you just said, sir, which is we have to be willing in a time of crisis to be nicer to our friends than, than we are otherwise. It doesn't mean our friends get to do whatever they want. I'm personally not happy with the South Korean government and their companies right now with regard to export controls. But in a time of crisis, we need to do more. We need to show that uh, we'll stand up with them. That's a way to reassure them and to deter China. So the, those measures that you talked about of reducing barriers to the U.S. market in a time of crisis, I think, are the right measures. And of course, you have people who are very sensitive to that in the U.S. Um, I'm not suggesting that we rush to reduce barriers when there's a case of, of Argentina coercing Bolivia, but China is in a very different category. So I think that's the, the strength of the legislation and, as you said, um, the fact that it's legislation that could be passed on a bipartisan basis uh, would be uh, ideal. I think, again, you know, I, I don't mean to repeat myself, but the legislation is addressing a symptom, and the problem is if we take these steps to, to help our friends, 
and it happens to be in that year, we had $200 billion in new money going to China. Um, on net, we're still helping the Chinese become better at coercion. So I, I'm, I think the legislation is a good idea. I support other sorts of legislation from the Congress addressing this issue. But I do think we need to look at if we're helping the Chinese more than we're countering them, the net benefit is we're hurting our friends. Um, so I don't disagree. I mean, there's discussion on how you slow down outbound investment and outbound flows. Um, maybe, Mr. Reynolds, let me, let me ask you on, on that perspective, how should we think about, you know, you still see a lot of U.S. company investment flowing into China. Um, you know, I am you know, not of the thought that says we should be telling companies what they can and can't do, but I also do you think there is increased risk? So how should we think about outbound investment and, and perhaps approach that? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Congressman. Um, you know, first, if I, if I may want to go to H.R. 1135, um, I really, what I really like about that bill is that the timelines you all build in for a speedy response. Uh, I think that's really a key part of uh, you know, any sort of counter strategy to counter China's economic uh, coercion. Something that you see in, in the sanctions literature is that you know, sanctions uh, tend to be most effective uh, really based when they're threatened and then af shortly after they're imposed. Uh, so in that window before markets can adjust, they kind of bite the most. So that's really, you know, to borrow a medical term, sort of the golden hour that we need to be responding and getting relief to the targeted countries uh, so that they don't back down in the face of China's uh, economic coercion. One other thing I would say that, uh, you know, a big missing piece of the response so far, though, is also on this resiliency side. I think the U.S. needs to get back in the business of uh, negotiating free trade agreements. Uh, we've seen China continue to expand its presence in these trade agreements, uh, you know, applying to join CPTPP. Uh, uh, RCEP became effective uh, last year. Uh, you know, a greater and greater proportion of the world's countries uh, now see China as their largest trading partner instead of the United States. So that's a, a, a big missing component. Uh, quickly on, on outbound uh, investment, uh, I agree. I think there's a, a need to control this outbound investment, uh, especially in these critical technologies where China could gain this choke point leverage over the United States. Uh, the Biden administration, I know, is looking at uh, technologies, semiconductors, biotech, uh, green tech. Uh, I would say one thing on that, though, we also need to make sure that we multilateralize those efforts. We see this with the export controls. When we do these things unilaterally, there, are, there can be loopholes. And so I think the same thing for outbound investment. We need to be looking to, to multilateralize that. Great. Thank you. I know so I'm out of time. Thank you. I now recognize uh, Congressman Barr for your five minutes of questioning. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And I want to follow up uh, right where we left off with that uh, good question from the ranking member about outbound investment. Uh, 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 Dr. Scissors, uh, my bill, the Chinese Military and Surveillance Companies Sanctions Act, sanctions specific companies on four specific U.S. government lists, the DOD 1260H uh, Chinese military company list, Treasury's non-SDN Chinese military industrial complex companies list, and Commerce's entity list and military end user list. And, they, and the bill harmonizes these lists um, and imposes OFAC sanctions on them to send a signal that not only are these companies off limits on U.S. exchanges, but over the counter on foreign exchanges, and they uh, presumably have a multilateral effect insofar as it's OFAC sanctions, uh, and so uh, it signals to non-U.S. investors these are also off limits to them. Uh, I'd like your thoughts on this approach. Uh, does it provide Ameri the American private sector, specifically asset managers, index aggregators, investors, with sufficient clarity and certainty about what Chinese businesses are red light businesses and which uh, Chinese entities are green light? Uh, I, I do think that the bill uh, would be an important step forward. I think the key word you use there is clarity. Uh, two things that it does. One, it, it, it tells us exactly what the rationale is for these restrictions. And two, uh, as I'm sure you and your staff and everybody who's followed this are aware, harmonization of U.S. lists would be a great idea for the private sector. Um, sometimes you'll meet private sector actors and you'll tell them, well, did you check this list? And they're like, what? There's another list, um, and, and you know we have we have commerce, defense, state. We have different uh, treasury. We have different agencies creating different groups of of, of companies that they want to single out. 
Um, harmonizing that list for the sake of an action is a, is a positive step. Explaining the rationale for your action, which is done in the bill, is also a positive step. I think on the multilateral side, uh, to get to both outbound investment in general and your bill in particular, we're the leader on this. Uh, it's not an accident that company, uh, countries began looking at in, inbound investment reform after we passed CFIUS reform. We provide the technical information and the know-how to most of our partners. So I think there's an automatic multilateral benefit when you set out a U.S. policy uh, clearly. That doesn't mean they're going to do exactly what we did. It means that they can learn from it and be encouraged by it. So I, I think I, I wouldn't say the bill is, in my view, a solution to all the problems because we do have critical technologies to, to consider. That's a difficult debate. I think the, the, the your approach is excellent because when we say the, we're, we're, these are bad Chinese entities that we shouldn't do business with, we're not actually implementing that. The entity list, for example, is a licensing process. Yep. We don't want to say, oh, this company deserves to be on the entity list, later give them a license, and it turns out American investment is going to the company. So I think, you know, I, I see yours, uh, your bill as, as there are other options as well, but it's an excellent first step because yeah. the private sector should be able to handle it better than the current yeah, confusing and, U.S. rates. And, and our bill not only uh, requires coordination, entity list, uh, commerce, treasury, and DOD, uh, but, but it also uh, does now the am amendment and nature of substitute we're working on uh, also requires as these agencies update the list that they look at, uh, they, they look at special uh, sectors of, uh, of special concern, so these critical uh, technology sectors. And I would, um, uh, I would invite my colleagues, uh, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Uh, Kim, who's on the select committee with me on China, uh, and I've talked to ranking member Christian Morthy about my approach. This needs to be a bipartisan effort. I think it can and should be, um, uh, uh, Chairwoman Kim. So want to engage with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to, to make this uh, uh, the, the right approach and, and the, the approach that um, is consistent with our basic default value of uh, uh, cross-border capital flows, but identifying these specific entities of concern, of national security concern, Chinese military technology and surveillance companies, uh, uh, and, and excising them from U.S. Investor, uh, uh, US investors' uh, um, uh, investments. Um, I, let me just uh, go to Mr. Raphael really quickly. Um, I, I was interested in your testimony uh, that you said the CHIPS Act, um, while, while generally positive, uh, doesn't help smaller, more agile companies uh, and eliminate the fear that foreign entities will ultimately reap the benefit. Can, can you amplify that, that testimony and, and uh, uh, obviously as a victim of Chinese uh, commercial espionage, what do we need to do to, to protect uh, smaller companies like yours in the semiconductor space? Well, we're relying on policymakers, again, to creatively utilize all tools in the toolbox to help protect us. I, I make cool things. I, I don't know how to protect them, uh, per se. But what I can say is that the CHIPS Act is a double-edged sword. And so far as companies like mine that will innovate and grow a garden, uh, at the end may be harvested by foreign entities. So we, I think, need to ensure that, that the resources to, to grow this garden are present, but also the resources to defend it. Thank you. My time has expired. Now I recognize Representative Andy Kim for your five minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much for all of you coming on out here. Uh, Mr. Reynolds, I'd like to start with you. Well, you, were, you were talking in a, uh, earlier today about uh, this kind of analysis of, of different countries and whether or not they've been subjected to economic coercion and how they fared, whether that was uh, uh, something that was positive or negative in terms of moving in that direction. Uh, that, that was really interesting to me. This kind of question of, uh, uh, that I'm kind of thinking about right now is, is our best understanding of, of you know, which countries are most vulnerable to this type of economic coercion? Do we see any types of, of patterns? Is it about you know, geographic proximity to China? Is it about certain size markets or last, you know, certain type of uh, uh, lack of diversification in their economy or other things? I'm just kind of curious if you've been able to kind of elicit any insights to them this. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for your question. I would, uh, you know, say just directly the most vulnerable countries are going to be the, the smallest countries. Uh, and not, you know, 
small countries can still be resilient if they have advanced economies uh, and advanced political systems. So the most vulnerable countries are really going to be uh, the countries that do not have market systems uh, and do not have strong political systems. So um, you kind of see it when the, in the eight case studies that we have, probably the two where uh, China had the most success of coercing uh, and getting the policy outcomes that it wanted was against uh, the Philippines and Mongolia. Uh, at the time, Mongolia was facing uh, a recession and was very susceptible to you know Chinese threats of cutting off uh, concessional loans. So they quickly apologized for inviting the Dalai Lama and then uh, you know promised not to invite the Dalai Lama uh, back. Um, the Philippines is a little bit more complex because you had uh, Duterte uh, you know elect, become elected and or was elected and then kind of switched uh, you know the Philippines alignment. Uh, but I would say in those two cases, uh, had the, sort of the weakest political systems and weakest economies, and China had the most success. Uh, Mr. Fyth, I wanted to bring you in on this because I, I was looking through your testimony. It, it seemed like you were kind of looking at this similar question, in fact, some of the same data there. Um, I, I'd like kind of your reaction on that from both in terms of what, what Mr. Reynolds just said, but also in your testimony you said, look, uh, you know, there are some examples where it's, where they've been able to push back, but there are some broader overarching examples as well where uh, it has been effective. So over to you. Thanks for the question. Uh, indeed, you know, the CSIS report is, is a really valuable study and allows us to, to work through these questions, which really are sort of interesting and, and nuanced in a, in a detailed way. You know, as that report highlights uh, and as, as was just discussed, there have been these several cases that have gotten a lot of attention. And on those cases, you know, roughly eight or 10 over a decade, China's record of apparent success in the particular sort of political aims of its coercion against these individual countries is very mixed. And there are interesting lessons in there about how challenging it is for China to achieve some of its objectives in some of these cases. So for example, you know, they generate fear and loathing in these foreign capitals. They sometimes make foreign public opinion and strategic opinion harden against Beijing. Similar effects can happen when China goes after companies, right? China's not looking to make itself right now seem like an inhospitable place, say, to foreign semiconductor companies. So when it takes an action and goes after a Micron, it can have a some coercive bullying effect, but it also has an obvious downside of making companies and governments that are interested in those companies have less faith in these economic yeah. relationships with China. The problem is, that the full scope of China's economic coercion, the full definition would appear uh, to extend far, far beyond any eight or 10 or 12 cases. China is using its economic coercion far more broadly. China has been able to continue to carry out its human rights abuses in Xinjiang largely because of its economic coercive power, the sense that other countries don't want to anger Beijing. We have had a lot of discussion and interest in the Congress in the fact that in the United States, in our media, in Hollywood, across corporate America, uh, major leaders with influential voices are very careful about what they say about uh, China one, for one fear of economic kinda, one response. Thing, one thing I'll just kind of push back a, a little bit on this from, I mean, look, we've, we've struggled, uh, you know, 20 years ago to, to, to address Sudan and the, the genocide in Darfur. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, we've struggled in a lot of those cases, not necessarily because of just, you know, market issues. We have a lot of challenges in terms of how to actually address human rights abuses all over the world in both large markets and, and smaller uh, countries as well. Uh, I, I just want to say this as for, for my colleagues, I think this is a really important issue about just, you know, where can we have precision? Where can we have the scalpel? Where can we use that? And where do we need the broad tools? And I think that that's something that we think about in terms of understanding all the tools in our toolbox and recognizing it. Um, I think for us to have that kind of fidelity would make our policies and our strategies stronger. And with that, I'll yield back. Thank you, Representative Kim. I now recognize Mrs. Reddy Wagon for five minutes. Talo Falava, good morning. Thank you, Chairwoman Kim and Ranking Member Bearer for holding this hearing, and thank you all for appearing today. Earlier this week, we held a hearing in the Natural Resources Committee on countering China in the FAS and Pacific territories. One of the stories we have heard is how China has punished the Republic of Palau by hurting its tourism industry. Another example is how when Australia called for an independent investigation of COVID-19, China banned Australian goods. So this hearing is a good follow-up to that hearing from earlier this week. Now, Mr. Fyth and Dr. Scissors, my questions are directed at you. 
Uh, given the PRC's extensive economic coercion in the Pacific Islands, what option does the United States have to work in tandem with Pacific Island countries to ensure that the PRC's aggression is not successful? Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, certainly, that we, we've seen this problem worsen in recent years, and we've seen uh, U.S. diplomatic and strategic attention grow uh, toward the, the Pacific Islands and, and the China-related challenges there, but not yet sufficiently. Um, some of that is actually playing out, you know, very much in real time this week because President Biden was going to be uh, the first U.S. president to visit uh, Papua New Guinea. He was going to do this in a few days after going to Japan for the G7, and he would have attended in Papua New Guinea the Pacific Islands Forum. And this you know, reflects sort of a, a stepping up of U.S. interest that goes back into the previous administration and has in various ways continued since. Uh, the president canceled that trip in light of the, the uh, debt ceiling questions here back in Washington, which is earning a lot of, um, of predictable criticism and concern uh, from the region, which wants more U.S. engagement. That U.S. engagement uh, can take the form, certainly, of uh, greater economic uh, interest, which is often difficult given you know, companies uh, have a hard time operating in some of these environments. The U.S., and with the Congress over the last several years, has strengthened tools like our Export-Import Bank, our Development Finance Corporation, but bringing those tools to the speed and the magnitude of relevance, including in the Pacific Islands, has really been a challenge. One obvious solution is working especially closely with our allies, including Australia, of course, in that region, but also Japan when it comes to matters of export credit and development finance, where the Japanese have been very successful over a very long time. Dr. Scissors. Uh, thank you for the question. I think I would, I would start with the basics, which is that we should not be considering in the Pacific Islands or anywhere else that we get into a bidding war with the Chinese. We, we're not, we don't want to be in a situation where, oh, you offered $100 million worth of aid, we're all for $110 million, and around the world we do this everywhere, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa. I think the, 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 the best strategy for the U.S., uh, to keep it simple, is to try to make the Pacific Island states as strong, as prosperous as, as possible. So our goal should not be to say, oh, China's going to build something for you, we'll build something bigger. It should be to say, how can we make uh, your societies uh, more resilient, but really also more successful, uh, make lives better for people? And then there won't be a, a thought that, oh, we should reach out to the Chinese and they, they have some magic a wand they're going to wave. So I think the, the, the basics are we should consider our, our Pacific ally uh, friends and allies, Pacific Island friends and allies, uh, we should consider their well-being. And, 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 as, and as they do better, they're going to be less interested in Chinese quick fixes. Thank you. And uh, as a follow-up, other than re-signing the compacts of free association, what steps can the United States take to coordinate an allied response that safeguards the Pacific Islands from Chinese predatory practices? Mr. Feith, Dr. Scissors. I would just note one additional point, uh, which relates partly to what Dr. Scissors has mentioned about resilience, are efforts that uh, would apply not only in the Pacific but around the world to have a better understanding and greater transparency around uh, Beijing-backed corrupt practices, because one of the ways that uh, the Chinese Communist Party takes advantage of uh, countries that don't have uh, strong resilience at home and generally uh, works in ways that are disadvantageous to us is they, uh, they use corrupt practices, they use them uh, politically and commercially, and these can be very effective, unfortunately, in uh, capturing a lot of local political influence to the detriment of those countries and to the detriment of our interests. Our ability in intelligence terms, in law enforcement support terms, in support for public prosecutors and journalism and transparency and sunlight in these cases is really very important and another area for U.S. and allied coordination. The gentlewoman's time has expired. I now recognize Mr. Waltz for your five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Fyth, I just wanted to continue with you. I think, you know, as we talk about economic coercion um, language matters, language from our leadership matters. So I'll ask you a question I've asked uh, many in the administration and, and thought leaders in this space. Is the Chinese Communist Party in a Cold War with the United States using just the basic understanding of using non-military means to supplant, replace, defeat a foe? 
yes, and Xi Jinping's own words, especially spoken to his own leadership, say so. They believe they're in a systemic and existential challenge with us and that they will win. So I think that language matters uh, so much because if we're asking investors, researchers, academia, small businesses, we can go down the line to essentially walk away from a, from a market, from profit, for you know, funding for research that they may care about. Um, we need to think about it as a society in that light, all right? I'd agree. Um, is there anyone that disagrees? Because I, I hear a lot, you know, oh, no, no, we're in a competition. Competition sounds like a couple of countries in the Olympics. I mean, this is a, this is a, this is a Cold War, and they seek to win it, and they seek to win it without firing a shot. That's right, and, and, and part of the challenge is that, you know, we have um, habits and institutions that are, for, for good historical reasons, driven to see especially U.S. government action that is limited and restrained and surgical and careful. And that's generally a good thing, right? We want our, right. um, our government intervening, say, in markets in ways that are uh, generally limited. It's just that China poses a scale of a threat sure. and a degree of economic uh, connectedness to us that we've never faced before. Just, so when just we have in the... In the sense of time, I agree, I want everyone to make money. <laughs> no problem. Uh, but when it comes to the expense of our national security and key dependencies, I, I, along those lines, there's been, I mean, there is a plethora of information out there on uh, the CCP's dominance of global critical mineral supply chains, particularly cobalt, owns now nearly half of the world's mining, owns three quarters of the refining, lithium, manganese, we can go down the list. I think my question is, how does the Biden administration's emphasis, billions that we're spending, that we've passed out of this body on green energy, in, uh, energy, electric vehicles, including in our own military, to combat climate change, increase China's economic leverage over the United States, and in accordance with their own Made in China 2025, which is not just to insource their own manufacturing, it's to create global dependencies. Right. So, how does that increase their leverage? It, it would seem, unfortunately, though, a lot of uh, a lot of our own recent policy decisions are pointing in the direction of significantly increasing Beijing's leverage over us and over our energy economy. And this was one of the factors, after all, that appears to have made Vladimir Putin confident that he could invade Ukraine and survive the consequences was because he understood that he had a strong degree of leverage over Western have European you seen, energy. Have um, you as you study? CCP writings very closely, the actual translations. Um, I, I mean, it, they've somewhat tried supply chain coercion with the Japanese and the Australians. You believe that is, that is baked in, they are prepared to do that, even at risk of damage to their own markets and economies uh, with the United States? Oh yeah, and, and we've seen them not only do so, but especially since COVID, Xi Jinping has been increasingly explicit about this. He gave a series of speeches in 2020, and these speeches were then reflected in the 14th five-year plan that was published by Beijing in March of 2021, where he spoke explicitly about tying global supply chains and dependencies increasingly to China using what he calls the powerful gravitational field of China's domestic market in order to make other countries dependent on them while reducing the dependency of China on others. Just in the few seconds I have remaining, shifting a bit, uh, the board that oversees the thrift savings plan, which is the military's 401k, uh, has made a series of moves to invest their international index into Beijing, amongst other, because of this, again, this notion of we're just here for returns. Our military's own retirement plan to be invested into our greatest uh, adversary. Do you believe that this board and boards like it have a moral, have a fiduciary responsibility uh, to disinvest? Yes, and there were efforts to, to bring that about in 2020, especially that uh, I gather have been undone largely by some of the technical changes since then. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Well, thank you for being here today to speak about uh, this important and timely topic. I know we're all watching closely uh, as the G7 meets in Japan this week to discuss China and its economic practices. And the United States serves as an important counterweight, as you all know, 
to China's aggressive economic tactics around the world and in the Indo-Pacific region. The United States must continue to be an economic partner of first choice for nations around the world and work to build trust and goodwill between any country looking for transparent, sustained, and quality investments. But as you all know, there is more work to be done. So uh, Mr. Reynolds, the United States has multiple tools to counter China's economic coercion, which is mostly targeted towards smaller nations. In your testimony, you indicated that some of these tools include export financing, sovereign loan guarantees, and temporary tariff reductions. The United States also has many institutions that can support a country's development goals, such as with the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Though in recent years, it's become obvious that more countries need access to MCC funding. And that's why I introduced the Millennium Challenge Corporation's Candidate Reform Act, which would modernize MCC's statutory criteria and redefine the MCC's candidate country pool. Uh, and these changes would offer more countries an alternative to China-backed financing. Can you explain why it's important to ensure that more countries, especially those vulnerable to Chinese coercion, have access to U.S. economic support? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Congressman. Um, as you mentioned in, in our report, one thing we did see was that China has a preference for targeting uh, smaller countries. And one of our uh, you know, recommendations was that the United States should proactively seek uh, to build uh, resilience. So um, you know, not being uh, uh, an expert on uh, MCC, what I would say any policy that can uh, you know, proactively help those countries build the resilience should, uh, in theory, in the long run, make them more uh, resilient and able to stand up and withstand uh, Ch China's uh, economic coercion. One thing uh, I will say is that there, there could be you know, trade-offs with expanding the, the pool of eligible countries if you're raising that threshold uh, to allow richer countries in. You also need to make sure that doesn't come at the expense of smaller countries that are the, the most vulnerable. Sure. I'll open it up for anyone else also who would like to comment. No? OK. Uh, my second question is um, really about Chinese misinformation or disinformation and manipulation of certain industries. And this time I'm going to focus on an industry we don't focus on too much around here, but we should focus on more, which is the media and entertainment industry in the United States. Uh, Mr. Scissor, you spoke extensively about the advantages and disadvantages between the United States and China's economies. Uh, you also pointed out non-traditional means of economic coercion, uh, such as bullying Hollywood, the 2021 MBA spat, and what you describe as, quote, uh, data mercantilism. I'm interested in how China might use its market to influence aspects of American-made movies. Uh, for example, identities of certain characters have been changed, movie releases have been dropped, and whole scenes have been added to stay in good standing with the PRC. Uh, why do these changes undermine the role of Hollywood as a source of soft power and cultural diplomacy for the United States? And what implications does it have for China's economic coercion toolkit? Thanks for the question. Uh, I could talk a long time about new, the new data mercantilism coming out of China and our need to respond, but I'll focus on, on what happened with, with the entertainment industry. Uh, you've seen in the NBA, you've seen in Hollywood for a long time, you've seen in the NBA more recently, um, that, that gravitational pull of the Chinese market that, that David referred to, which is saying to, to companies, wouldn't it be easier if you change this movie a little bit and you could make a lot more money? It's very seductive. Uh, and what happens is this is part of what China considers to be information warfare. Stop letting people know what's actually happening in China. It matters at the level of an individual company operating in China, where the Chinese say stop sending data outside of the country. And it matters for US entities here who, who wouldn't appear, like the NBA, to have any real direct connection to China. Um, authoritarian governments like information control. And our advantage economically and as a society is to fight that off and to allow people to express their views freely without worrying about, uh, is this going to cost me money? And it's interesting because China has created a very competitive situation within Hollywood and American media where they only allow a certain number of movies, American movies, per year uh, to be shown in China. And so that's what gives them oftentimes a leverage to say, you know, we're not going to let you, we're not going to show your movie if you don't take this out or you change this or that. Uh, and there seems to be no discernible end in sight necessarily to that continuing. I, I think it would get worse. Um, one of the things I've noticed in our conversation uh, is just to drive home the point that sometimes we're slow in responding because we still think China is the same as it was 20 years ago. Xi Jinping's China is a different China, and we should expect more of that coercion, especially if we don't respond to it. You bet. I heard now I recognize Mr. Davison for five minutes. I thank the chairwoman. Thank you for our witnesses calling attention to uh, 
you know, really an incredibly important topic. I'm glad we're having this hearing today. Um, as a guy who's trying to make a manufacturing company work in the United States, uh, it, it was really obvious. We weren't just competing against other companies. We were competing against countries, and nowhere is that more true than China. So at this point, um, you know, in, well, let's go back to 2018. 2018, the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, tasked with monitoring China's compliance with WTO commitments, found China to have, quote, a poor compliance record and is, quote, violating, disregarding, and evading WTO rules. This committee has recognized that they're uh, abusing the uh, developing nation status uh, uh, claims within the WTO. So that was five years ago when those quotes were uh, cited in uh, the so I guess the real question is, is the WTO still an effective, or was it ever an effective mechanism to deal with the PRC's predatory economic practices? And uh, what should the United States do if the WTO structure is, in fact, failing? Mr. Scissors? Well, big question. Thank you. Uh, I do not think the WTO is effective any longer. I don't mean to say it was never effective. I don't mean to say it's a terrible idea. I think um, China has moved in a direction of, of violating WTO principles. Um, and, and gaming the WTO, and it is now of a size that it's intolerable. When China broke WTO rules in 2003, it wasn't great, but it wasn't as, as much of a strain on the system. Now they're more aggressive in breaking the rules under Xi than they were under Jiang Zemin at the time, uh, and they're much bigger. So I don't think the U.S. should just try to destroy the WTO, but I do think we should recognize the WTO cannot check Chinese behavior, and we're going to have to either act on our own or create another organization of some sort to do so. Yeah, and uh, so do you believe there's a coalition? Does anyone really believe there's a, you know, um, I, I think not just at the military academy I attended, but probably all of them around the world, uh, they would say you're more likely to win a war if you multiply your allies than you multiply your enemies. Uh, the curious thing is how hasn't China multiplied their enemies on trade? They've managed to do this to essentially every country around the world, yet how is it that we're not multiplying our allies to confront China on these abusive practices? I, my quick answer to that is, again, going back to how much credibility do we have? If the U.S. would take the lead on this, not all countries, not everyone, but some countries would join us. I think Japan, for example, would be very happy if the U.S. would take leadership on confronting Chinese predation. But it's hard to say you're taking the lead if you're still having money and technology flowing to China. Other countries see that and they say, well, you're saying one thing. This committee may be saying one thing very clearly, but the U.S. as a whole is not acting in that same way. So allies aren't going to rally to us until we're willing to, uh, to take the necessary actions ourselves. Yeah, so one of the things, as I was coming to Congress in 2016, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was falling apart. And, you know, it was a, the idea was we were going to solidify some folks in the Pacific Indo-Pacific region against what China was doing, but we were kind of doing it passively. We weren't really confronting China about their abuses. We were just going to build some allies there. Um, and I think that's a significant part of why TPP unraveled is because it didn't actually confront China. It's sort of passive aggressive, sort of this other way. And it failed from both sides. Uh, you know, both, both parties started campaigning against TPP in, uh, in the 2016 election cycle. Uh, is there a path where we might be able to put something like that together, or have we missed the moment for anyone? Well, I, I didn't, I, I'd say I did not like uh, the, the substance of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I liked the idea. I supported the idea. And then I, I saw the final agreement, didn't like it. And the, the main reason I didn't like it is exactly what you said. For example, in rules on, on uh, state-owned enterprises were very weak for the sake of making Vietnam and Singapore happy. But it meant that we weren't doing anything to, to limit the behavior of Chinese state-owned enterprises. Uh, I think we could, with the right partners, create an organization. But it would have to be an organization uh, that's really focused on China. It's not a, ge a more general organization. As you bring in more countries, they have different interests with regard to China. So we'd have to stand up and say, look, uh, we'd love a strong TPP. We didn't get it. Um, so as a substitute for that, uh, as, a, as an arrangement that is, that is directed at Chinese economic predation, we're going to propose something else. Yeah, thank you. And I Wholly concur. That's really where I landed. And in 2017, I introduced uh, uh, the Global Trade Accountability Act. Uh, the counterpart, Senator Lee, uh, in the Senate. Uh, and I really think it's timely that Congress reclaim the Article One authority we have on trade. And frankly, we represent the people, not just uh, you know one person at the administration, but really this body fully engaging on it. 
because I do believe it is one of the most important problems that we confront today. It's shaping our foreign policy, our domestic policy, and our economic future. So I hope we do that. I yield back. Yep. I now recognize myself for five minutes, and uh, I want to ask the question to Mr. Alon. You know, how would you counsel an entrepreneur looking for talent in a high-tech industry like yours? Be very cautious who you hire. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, fundamentally, I, you know, I, I can suggest that it's 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 very challenging to find talent uh, that 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 is. Uh, not a, a, a sharing a risk profile in addition to the reward they can bring. Uh, so I, I would only say think think hard. Are you having a hard time finding talent to work with you at your company? Absolutely. Okay. Or is there anything that we can be of help to you in terms of policy initiatives? Uh, well, well, certainly right now, I, I think there's a, a, a very clear and present danger that we're in front of uh, insofar as our, our defense capabilities. One uh, might recall in Desert Storm how the M1A1 Abrams tanks had a firing pin that cost 99 cents, and it didn't work, and what we ended up with was a block of metal in the desert. I, I make machines that do process control. They help evaluate microchips that are going to go into some of these very glamorous, very large, and very critical systems. And I'm struggling right now to find the resources necessary and the protections necessary to ensure that that firing pin or the equivalent microchip thereof in these large-scale projects doesn't cause another hunk of metal in the desert. Thank you. Well noted. Uh, Mr. Feit, you mentioned, obviously, we all know um, a G7 meeting is happening right now. And uh, I want to ask you, and then maybe the others can chime in, uh, what do you hope to see come out of this uh, G7 on economic coercion? Well, we've been uh, told by the governments involved that they do plan to make this a focus and put it on the agenda and perhaps issue some sort of special statement uh, about the economic coercion problem. It's not clear, though, if that statement will mention China, which is not the most important thing, but it is a proxy for how much uh, you know, diplomatic weight and, and frankly, uh, you know, effort and risk countries are willing to put behind these measures. If the statement is just a statement and it's hollow and not backed by the willingness of the national governments you know, back home to take real measures to push back, to incur pushback from China as a result, statements of the G7 aren't going to uh, matter for much, unfortunately. And so it speaks partly to the question from a moment ago about which trade coalitions can really work. The G7 would be a great one, um, including if the European Union is willing to be involved, but that's 27 member states and that's complicated at best. Beginning perhaps with AUKUS countries, that is the US, Australia, and the UK, or with uh, Japan as well. We have the Quad, of course, where Japan, Australia, and India fit. These might be uh, smaller but more appropriate because more robust groupings for doing some of this overdue pushback. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time, and I would like to now recognize Mr. Sherman for your five minutes questioning. Our tax code has a capital gains allowance, much lower taxes on the money you make by selling stocks, bonds, other investments. It's designed to encourage you to invest in the U.S. economy, create jobs and economic progress. Can any witness here raise your hand if you think you can put forward an argument why we provide this capital gains allowance to those who invest in the uh, uh, these equity securities of Chinese-based companies? Can any of you think of a reason why that's good U.S. policy? Uh, I'll, uh, the record should indicate no one raised their hands. Um, tariffs are really the only across-the-board way that we can disentangle our economy. Um, and disentangling is so important because right now, China doesn't need to hire a lobbying firm here in Washington because the biggest American companies feel that their profits are dependent upon us kowtowing to China. Um, if we had a one quarter percent tariff, just one quarter percent tariff on all Chinese goods, and we increased it by a quarter percent every month, then companies that fail to disengage from China would find a uh, 40, they'd be at a 40 percent disadvantage by the end of the decade. 
Um, finally, uh, and I, I don't know if this is, I assume this has not been brought up at the hearings. China allows only 40, roughly, American movies to go into China every year. So if you're a studio, you hope it's yours. So they'll never make another movie about Tibet. Richard Gere, sorry. Um, not just because they can't have that movie displayed in China, but because if a studio makes a movie about Tibet, none of their movies are ever getting into China. And they know that. I'm saying the quiet part out loud. Um, does anyone on the panel have an idea of what we can do to make sure that China doesn't use that kind of economic uh, coercion to affect what Americans uh, see, whether it is to uh, exercise, you know, uh, we have uh, uh, American basketball uh, players and officials talking about uh, human rights in China. We have movie studios that would like to make uh, this or that movie but would be subject to retaliation. Does anybody have a, uh, a plan just to make sure that the First Amendment isn't interfered with uh, by China? Well, Congressman, one related thought would be to find an appropriate way to ban TikTok because the kind of information power, the kind of what the Chinese Communist Party calls global discourse power, and the kind of ability to propagandize to Americans and undermine our democracy, including undermining our you know, First Amendment spirit of an open debate that is not coerced by foreign adversaries, is advanced increasingly by TikTok, which is a kind of foreign influence in our democracy I, that no I, I adversary would, has ever enjoyed. I would point out that uh, there are a lot of Americans who really enjoy TikTok. They're worried that that enjoyment will be um, taken away from them. But I believe that, um, that, that uh, America can be self-sufficient in cat video distribution systems. <laughs> if, uh, if we didn't have TikTok, Americans would create TokTik and, and the kitties would still be there. Um, we have a huge uh, trade deficit uh, with uh, China. Uh, other is, in fact, it's the most lopsided uh, trading relationship in the history of mammalian life. Uh, do any of our witnesses have a plan other than the tariff idea that I put forward uh, to try to diminish that trade deficit? Yes. I, I mean, I, I have a partial solution, which is, um, you know, the 25 percent and sometimes 15 percent tariffs opposed by the Trump administration didn't actually shrink the trade. And, and I'll point out, the average tariff right. on Chinese goods is under 5%. Exactly. That was a very selective system. Go I, on. Agreed. Um, I think we can start in an area of, I hope, bipartisan agreement that will, it will not solve the trade deficit problem, but it will certainly reduce it, which is identify the goods that we do not want to depend on the Chinese for. So there's dollars in goods we may not care as much about. There's a debate over what those are. There's also dollars in goods we know we care about. We can address both the supply I, chain dependence. I, I understand and the trade that deficit. selectivity. I'll say whatever the goods are. You run for every billion dollars of trade deficit, we're losing ten thousand jobs. And those who say that we have a, a labor shortage in this country, I think, are wrong until labor wages start going up. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. I know the votes have now been called, so I wanted to thank the uh, witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for asking those questions. Uh, other members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, so we will ask you to respond to those in writing. And I now recognize Mr. Berra for any closing remarks you may have. Great. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, you know, I don't think Democrats and Republicans think about this issue in different ways. I actually think we're all taking this very seriously. And, you know, I, I think members on both sides of the aisle raised legitimate questions and again the witnesses I, I thank them for you know ra raising the issues that that um, we really do have to think about in an urgent way there aren't easy answers when we you know again I tend to be a free market guy I tend not to want to use a heavy hand of government to tell companies what they can and can't do where they can and can't invest but I also do think um, it's important for us that you know mr. Waltz raised, you know, our pension funds continuing to go into China, um, continuing to disadvantage us. I've talked to CEOs about that as well, and, you know, often they're just, you know, sh there's shareholder activism, there's just this intense focus on quarterly profits. Again, 
you know, you know, Mr. Sherman raises some issues of how we might be able to use the tax code to help influence that. I mean, this is worth a bipartisan conversation to think about, you know, how we, you know, protect our values, our freedoms, um, but also, you know, don't disadvantage, you know, what is, you know, this strategic competition, you know, I don't use the Cold War language, but we do know we are, um, you know, headed towards a confrontation, and how do we head that confrontation off? Um, and, and I think that's important. So again, thank you for holding this hearing. I would encourage all my colleagues to take a look at the, um, the legislation that we put forward. I think it is a, a good first step. It's not a last step, um, and there's a lot more for us to do. So thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. And again, thank you to all the witnesses. You know, as we uh, prepare for this hearing, we wanted to um, make sure that uh, we are addressing the economic coercion from PRC. And I think hearing from our uh, witness, Mr. Alon, uh, it, was, it is more than ever important that we need to stress that American foreign policy must serve the interests of the ordinary Americans and the businesses as well. And then also the United States must also take on the PRC's predatory practices, which is why we had a very great discussion here. Thank you. And uh, lastly, I think we need to emphasize that America must lead and then uh, bring its allies and partners along. And that's very, very important. We need to show to our allies that they can trust us that United States will be the choice to do business with and to rely on us to protect their interests, as well as uh, showing through the, the combination of cooperation that we're working with our allies and partners that our adversaries should be able to fear us. Uh, with that, I wanna thank you so much for being with us. And pursuant to committee rules, all members may have five days to submit statements, questions, and extra extraneous materials for the record and subject to the length limitations. So without objection, the committee stands adjourned. I have an extra copy for you, or did you want the oral testimony? Uh, just what you read off of today. Okay. Hold on a second, let me yeah. show you don't have it the other one. Um, you if you're going to stick around for a few hours, sure. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you again. I had a question for you. Um, okay. It was interesting that... So, sorry, I missed the, the testimony at another hearing, but uh, what did I miss? Well, uh, I run a microchip uh, quality assurance company uh, located in Los Angeles. Um, My town? Yes. Campbell Hall over here. Yeah, yeah. I think you're just in the valley if I'm not, not wrong. And parts of the west side. Yeah, absolutely. From Sherman Oaks. Exactly. We were, we were uh, us too. the same. Us too. That's where we're from. So. Oh, you're from Sherman Oaks? Actually, I went to Carpenter City. Avenue Elementary, Walter Reed. She went to Campbell Hall. Yeah. So we're uh, right in the neighborhood. Local. Let me get your card here. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, we're, we're, we're actually still, uh, the company is still located in downtown LA. Yeah. We, we didn't go to Silicon Valley, and uh, we got robbed by a bunch of Chinese guys. They went and stole our technology, went back to China, set up a copycat company, and then even worse than that, started attacking us from China by disclosing our trade secrets, and then Chinese uh, control entities came and told us they wanted to uh, finance us if and only if we give them all our trade secrets. We told them, um, forgive my colorful language, I'm from the area, but exactly what I said to them was, fuck you, I'm an American. And uh, here I am today, uh, trying to stay Thank you, I really appreciate it. And so there's no enforcement of IP. I mean, it used to be you're worried about the, you know, uh, CDs being sold in sure. open markets, and that was the, that was the IP. I mean,